Okay. I think you will find that, in fact, there are quite a few similarities between the pediatric palliative care we practice in Toronto and what I, we just heard Lucy describe in the Czech Republic and in Prague and Motil Children's Hospital. The big difference is what Lucy and her team managed to accomplish in about three years, it took us about 25 years to do. So really quite impressive to see all that's already been established. What I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about myself, how I got here today and how I became the medical director of palliative care in Toronto. We'll then focus a little bit about our model of palliative care, how we became the PAC team, and I'll tell you more about that. The shared care model that we use to deliver palliative care in the community for children reaching their end of life. Emily's House Children's Hospice. PACT, the community outreach nurse practitioner, a pilot that we started in 2015. And finally, I'll share some lessons learned over the course of my uh, career that I think will have some application to those of you working in adult palliative care and adult hospice. So whenever I introduce myself in Canada to people and I let them know what I do, a pediatric palliative care physician, I always hear the same thing. People say, you do what? I can't believe it. And they want to know how would someone like me enter a field like pediatric palliative care? I've realized over the years that there was not one major event that led me here, but probably a series of different things that have influenced my career path. And I'll share one of you with them today. In third year medical school in Canada, this is the time when we start seeing our own patients in the hospital. We put on the, la the white lab coat, we fill our pockets with books, we put our stethoscope around our necks, and they set us out to start looking after patients. And my very first rotation in the hospital was on internal medicine. And when you start off in a Canadian hospital, they give you one patient to look after. My one patient was a gentleman in his 70s. It was not this individual, but someone that looked like this individual. A gentleman in his 70s who was diagnosed with pneumonia. A classic first patient for a first-time medical student. Every morning I would come into this gentleman's room and I would take a full history, asking him all about his vaccinations as a child, looking at his travel history, as if things changed from every single day. <laughs> and every morning, I would do a complete physical exam from head to toe. I can tell you there has never been a patient admitted to a hospital with pneumonia who has had their cranial nerves examined more times than this poor gentleman. And then I would go out and I would write two pages of notes in the chart and I would be done all my work by 10.30. And I would have nothing left to do. So I would journey back to this patient's room, pull up a chair, and we would just start talking, get to know one another. It turned out I had a lot in common with this person who was in his mid-70s despite his age dif our age difference. I got to know his family, his children, his grandchildren, and we became friends, to be honest with you. Over the course of the week, this patient did not seem to be improving. And I remember every morning, I would stand outside his room, and to my staff physician and the entire team, I would present the patient, what's going on, and what progress we're making. And I remember after about a week, my staff physician said to the patient, you know what, sir? We're worried that your pneumonia is not getting better. We're gonna get a CT scan of your chest to make sure that we're not missing anything important. And I was so embarrassed when this happened. The gentleman said, I will agree to the CT scan doctor as long as Dr. Rappaport says it's okay. <laughs> Keeping in mind, I was just a medical student. But this was the type of relationship that we had formed and the trust that occurred. I'm very sad to say that the CT scan showed why he wasn't improving. What we thought was infectious pneumonia was actually metastatic bladder carcinoma. We found the disease everywhere in his body, and within a week, he rapidly declined and died in hospital. My very first patient, my very first death. You would think that the story ends there, but the real learning that came for me happened after that. I went home and I saw in the newspaper the announcement of this patient's death, and that his funeral would be taking place a few nights later at a church. And I said to my team, you know what? 
I think I'd like to go to this gentleman's funeral to pay my last respects. And my staff physician said to me, you know, Adam, this is your first patient, your first death. If you're going to start going to all your patients' funerals, you're going to be spending very little time in the hospital and a lot of time in churches. I think it was good advice. It was definitely a reason to pause and start thinking. But the next thing that was said to me I found even more interesting. My senior fellow, the supervisor underneath the staff, said to me, you know, Adam, there's another reason, reason you should consider not going to the funeral. And I said, what's that? He said, think of the message that it will be sending to the family of this patient. I, I thought, what message could that possibly be other than that I care? And he said, perhaps your being there is an indication that you feel sorry, you feel guilty about what happened, that perhaps it was because of you that this patient died. This was never something that crossed my mind. I knew it wasn't me that killed the patient. It was the cancer all over his body that killed the patient. But this is what was said to me. Despite the advice of my staff and my fellow, I made the decision that it was something important to me to go to this gentleman's funeral. But I do remember pausing before I stepped into the church and wondering, am I making a mistake? Am I doing the wrong thing? Well, I worked up the courage, I entered the church, and I was greeted to a hero's welcome. The wife of this gentleman introduced me proudly to all the family members. She insisted that I sit with her in the front row for the entire service between her and her children. This is the way that I was treated. At this time, I had no idea I was going to wind up in palliative care. I didn't even know I wanted to be a pediatrician. But I learned from this moment that death is something we fear in medicine. It is something that we are uncomfortable with. It is the enemy, and it is something that we, as healthcare providers, struggle with. In addition to big events like this all along the way in my career, there were lots of key influences that led me down this path. And one of them was this gentleman here, Dr. Larry Liebrach. Larry Liebrach is a giant in palliative care in Canada, North America, in South America, and certainly well known in some parts of Europe. He really was a pioneer in our field. In the 1980s, Larry was a family physician, and he recognized, he was working in the middle of the HIV AIDS epidemic, that many patients in Toronto were dying. And he opened up the Temi Latner Center for Palliative Care, which was an extremely innovative way of looking after these patients in the mid to late 1980s. He created a center out of uh, one of Canada's largest adult hospitals that was consisting of about 20 palliative care physicians. And they would go into the homes of these patients so that they could have high quality end of life care into their homes. This is something that we all take for granted now because this is how palliative care is done with your mobile hospice units all throughout Europe, North America. But in the 1980s, this was the first of its kind. Nobody had thought to do palliative care on such a mass level all throughout the patients' homes in Canada. And this really changed everything. I met Larry in 2006 after I finished my pediatric training and I had decided that I had an interest in palliative care. There were no pediatric palliative care fellowships available in Canada, and so I made up my own fellowship. I hung out a little bit with the palliative care service at SickKids. I'll tell you more about them in a second. It consisted of a doctor who was there half time, as well as a nurse. I spent a lot of time at the Tammy Latner Center, and I went back to school to do a master's in bioethics where I spent my time thinking and writing about end-of-life issues for children and their families. And this is where I got to know Larry. And I discovered that Larry was not only a champion for adult palliative care, but he had a very big place in his heart for children as well. This is Larry at something called the Unicorn Gala in Toronto. Larry was the founder also of the Unicorn Gala. You see, Larry would go into the home of his adult patients who were dying, and he would recognize that in many of these homes, there were children 
children of the mothers and fathers that he was taking care of that were dying. And he and his 20 physicians did not know what to say or how to support these children. They had no idea. And he said something must be done. The children's hospital that I was trained in, SickKids Hospital, which is Canada's largest children's hospital, very similar to Motel, wasn't doing anything to support these children. And so Larry said it was going to be up to him. And he started this gala to raise funds for children like the ones you see up there whose parents were dying or had died under their care to make sure that he could hire grief support coordinators to give them the support that they need during the journey and after the death of their child. This wasn't the only thing that Larry did. Larry recognized in his work that certainly <clears throat> there must be children living in the Toronto area that also wish to be at home for end-of-life care. And he realized once again that my institution, the biggest children's center in Canada, one of the top children's hospitals in the world, was doing nothing about this. And he said, if they won't do it, I'm going to do it. And so he went across the street from the adult hospital and he met with the chief of pediatrics. He did not tell me that he was doing this. And he said, I would like to start looking after your children that live in Toronto. I want to give your families an opportunity to have end of life care at home if they want it. But I know that your families are going to be reluctant to trust me and my physicians are going to be very nervous about looking after children. So we would like to hire Dr. Rappaport to be a part-time pediatric consultant to our team. That he will work with us somehow, we'll figure out a way, and we will do this together. Half the time he'll work with our group at the Tammy Latner Center at the adult hospital and in the community. The other half of the time he will be a general pediatrician at SickKids Hospital, admitting patients from eMERGE onto the wards. And this is in fact how my career first got started. I didn't start as a pediatric palliative care provider in Canada's largest hospital. The only way I could get work was working with an adult group of palliative care physicians. This is me and Larry together just months before he died. This is us together at his home. He died about five years ago. But he guided me along the way and what we created together was just tremendous and so enjoyable. You see, Larry and I decided that the way it would work is that when Sick Kids Hospital had a patient that lived in the Toronto area that wanted to go home for end of life care, they would refer that patient to the Temi Latner Center, the adult group. I would get the call then, I would walk across the street to the children's hospital, and I would be very sure that when I met the family, I would wear my sick kids badge. This is a very important point because sick kids is a trusted center, just like families trust Motel Children's Hospital. And I would come in and I would meet the family and I would purposely talk about their physicians and their nurses by first name, showing them that I was a member of the pediatric team. I would review the entire situation and do a very thorough consult. And then afterwards, when everything was clear, I would arrange for the first home visit in the community for the adult palliative care doctors at the Temi Latner Center to come into the home to meet the child and the family in their home, to meet with the community nurses and the care coordinators, and I would be there to join them. And at this time, I would hand over the baton to the adult team, and I would talk and make sure that everybody was on the same page, that everybody understood what was going on, that the adult care providers appreciated what this rare genetic disease was and what the pathway I expected to be for the child. What were going to be some of the problems that would be encountered and what would be some of the treatments that we could use and the dosing strategies to make it work. And with that, I would step back and hand it over to this adult team. But then I would be there by phone whenever needed 24-7. And this is the way it worked for the first three years of my career. In fact, my career was spent all the time going back and forth from my office at the adult hospital, crossing University Avenue to go to the children's hospital and back again. 
two sides of the very same street in Toronto, back and forth. But when I went to these different institutions, what I was listening to was two very different conversations about death. On the adult side at the Temi Latner Center, everybody was talking about what we call in, in North America the silver tsunami. Our aging population. The fact of the matter is that there was more and more dying adults in Toronto, Canada, and I understand also in the Czech Republic. This is a, a problem across most first world countries. Our population is aging and more and more patients and adults are needing end of life care and they want it in the community. And the Temi Latner Center was freaking out because they said, how are we gonna meet this growing demand for end of life care in the community? On the other side of the street in the children's hospital, to be honest with you, nobody was talking about death and dying. And the reason was, thankfully, pediatric mortality rates had been plummeting. Over the last 60 years, because of innovations in medicine, vaccines, antibiotics, uh, intensive care in the pediatric ICUs, we had just seen the pediatric mortality rates in Canada drop completely. And so with this, nobody was thinking about investing in pediatric palliative care. This is why I could only get a job at the adult center. Now, everybody wanted to see that line go down further, but as far as pediatric crises go, Mortality was not a big issue. Nonetheless, it started to occur to me during this three-year period that things were about to change. I could see it happening in front of me. There were major shifts happening on the pediatric side and major shifts happening in the palliative care world that was about to lead to a great opportunity for pediatric palliative care to start to grow and flourish in my children's hospital. Let me share with you what those changes were. When I became a staff pediatrician at SickKids, I started admitting more and more patients under my care, and I recognized how much things had changed from when I was a resident and a medical student. Where were the children with asthma? Where were the children with cellulitis? Simple infections, gone. None of them were in my wards anymore. Now, to be a patient admitted at the hospital for sick children, you had to have severe cerebral palsy, developmental delay, a seizure disorder, fed by a feeding tube, maybe a tracheostomy, and an asthma exacerbation. We saw patients who had these chronic complex conditions filling up our beds with underlying problems that we couldn't fix the best we could do is treat the problem that brought them in and send them home with all these chronic problems still in place. And this was not a unique issue at the hospital for sick children. This is a study done by my pediatric colleague Jay Barry in the US who showed the change in admission patterns across 28 US children's hospitals. And what you can see is that for various reasons, the admissions for all sorts of children's were going up. This, in fact, is not true in Canada. This is more to do with some of the way healthcare is practiced in the US. But what was true is that one group of patients was outstripping them all. This group, with lifelong chronic conditions involving two or more body systems or complex progressive conditions, the types of patients that Lucy spoke about in her lecture the types of patients that Sergey mentioned as well that we are seeing more of in the adult side too. These are the patients that are taking over our academic health sciences center. Where are they coming from? Well, there's a lot of different explanations, but I think this study shows it so beautifully. What this study does is it is showing the outcome of very low birth weight infants in the neonatal intensive care unit in one major center in the US. And what they've done is they've taken bars of graph, pairs of graphs that are looking at two different time periods, the 1980s on the left and the 1990s on the right. And both sets are patients at different weights. What I can tell you, for those of you who are not pediatricians, these are very tiny infants born very prematurely. 
These are patients that 30 to 40 years ago would never survive. But what this study wanted to show is how things changed from the 1980s to the 1990s. The good news is, and the part that's celebrated in this story, is the black lines. What you can see is that we went from the 80s to the 90s that infant mortality and death started to plummet. Fewer and fewer of these low birth weight children were dying, but it was not without a consequence. Take a look at the gray bars. This represents infants living with impairment, often severe neurologic impairment. By cheating death, we were increasing morbidity. And this is where these growing number of children on our hospital wards were coming from, in part. And make no mistake, while these children were certainly living longer, they are not cheating death. These are still life-limiting conditions, as was nicely shown by my colleague Chris Futner in the US. This is a national study looking at national data across all American hosp uh, pediatric hospitals. And he wanted to show how mortality rates in children were changing between 1979 and 1997 within this group of children with chronic complex neurological conditions. So this does not include children with cancer. And what you can see is that across every age group, the, the boxes plot below the zero line. What this means is that mortality rates were going down across all the pediatric age groups. Something that is wonderful, except for one, that as this chi these children started to get older into young adulthood, their mortality rates were going up. In other words, we're not cheating death, we are just pushing it out a little bit further. That's what Chris Futner showed. As for the question about whether or not, we know these children are living longer, as to whether they're living better, this is a whole other question. So these were some of the changes that I was noticing taking place on the pediatric wards. And as I mentioned, there was also major shifts happening within palliative care that I think were going to lead to a big change and opportunities for pediatric palliative care to, to move forward. I'm going to tell you this very briefly because I think, given your background in uh, palliative care and hospice and your interests, this is a story that will be familiar to most of you. But when I think of our story in palliative care, I think of three distinct waves. The first wave we often think of is starting in 1967, when that uh, wonderful person, Dame Cicely Saunders, came onto the scene in London, and she recognized that things had really changed in the world. Whereas prior to that time, prior to that era, most adults were dying in the homes. Death was not something that we do in hospitals. Patients went to hospitals to get better, and when hospitals realized that they couldn't make the patients better, they sent them homes to die, they sent them home to die, to be with family, often with the help of religious groups like the church. Maybe there was a physician involved to help guide. But things had changed after the Second World War, societal shifts had changed, medicine had changed, and she saw that more and more patients had nowhere to go at the end of life. And as a result, more of them were entering hospital. She also believed that this was not leading to any positive improvements in the care. And she said that something needed to be done. And she founded St. Christopher's Hospice in 1967, which was a place for adult patients to go to to receive end-of-life care, high-quality end-of-life care. This is what she did. So when hospice began by Dame Cicely Saunders, it was really a focus on end-of-life and death. The next wave of palliative care, we might say, started in the late 70s and moved on throughout the 80s and 90s. And a key figure in this phase of palliative care was actually a Canadian, Dr. Balfour Mount. Balfour Mount is a surgeon. He was an adult urologist working at McGill Hospital. And Balfour Mount noticed a similar thing to Cicely Saunders, but he saw that it had become much, much worse. He would round with his urology team on the surgical wards, and he noticed that about half the patients on the wards were patients that they weren't going to get better. They were patients that were stuck in the hospital dying. And not only were they dying, they were dying very poorly. 
He and his team of surgeons did not know how to look after these patients, but he recognized there must be a better way. And in fact, he went to London, to the UK, and he studied the art and science of hospice medicine under the, the supervision of Cicely Saunders. And he realized that this could be the answer. This could be the way that we start to change things, start to address all the suffering that we see in our hospitals, start to give all of these patients, this dying cohort, high quality end of life care. But he realized that something had to be different, something had to change. You see, Cicely Saunders' hospice movement was still very much a fringe movement. You understand what I mean by fringe movement? It was something that was happening outside of modern medicine. It was happening over there to the side. And what Balfour Mount realized is that if, if this was ever going to be a big solution for the mass people that needed it, it was going to have to be accepted by the academic health sciences centers, by the universities, by modern medicine. It was going to have to come under that umbrella. And he felt that in order to do this, we needed to take a focus away from death and dying, something as we've already talked about, medicine wasn't that interested in and that focused on. He wanted the focus to be on suffering. And he felt that we could create a science about, uh, and a medicine that was focused on alleviating symptoms. He coined the term palliative care, which comes from the Latin palliare, which means to cloak, to hide the symptoms, not to fix the problem, but to hide the symptoms. And he felt that this would be something that would be more accepted. He also purposely, and this has been uh, stated in interviews with him, he said there's another reason we're going to switch to the term palliative care, because we need to move away from the term hospice. Hospice had become synonymous with death and dying. And in North America, this was not something that most patients, adult or pediatric, were interested in talking about. He felt by bringing this new word, palliative care, we could get away from the uh, idea of death and dying. We all know how that's worked out, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Which brings us to the third wave of palliative care, the wave that we are in right now, in the, in the 2000s all the way up to 2019, where palliative care still very much is about end-of-life care, still focuses on relieving suffering, but we emphasize that our real goal is about living and on maximizing quality of life, not just for those who are dying, but we recognize that the principles of palliative care, in fact, are appropriate for anybody living with a life-limiting or serious health condition. And so, as I mentioned, there were the, these major shifts happening on both sides. In my pediatric life, I saw that the wards were being filled with patients with chronic complex conditions that we couldn't fix, most of which were life-limiting in nature. And the best thing that we could offer these patients was finding a way to minimize their suffering and improve their quality of life. And at the same time, the winds were blowing in palliative care away from death and dying, more towards a focus on quality of life, something that was much more acceptable. And these two shifts together finally led to the opportunity for palliative care to grow at my institution, SickKids Hospital. And in 2011, SickKids realized that maybe it was right time to invest in palliative care, and they posted for a medical director, which I was eventually the successful candidate. I'd like to change gears now and tell you a little bit about when I arrived at SickKids, the model that we started to work together to create, or becoming packed, as I like to put it. So when I started, whoops, let's see if I can go back. No, oh, it's not going to work, I don't think. There it is. When I started, I would go around into the hospital and I would introduce myself to new families that I would meet and I would say, I'm Dr. Rappaport, a palliative care physician. And this was the look that I was greeted by by most parents. They had this look of fear in their eyes, like death himself had just walked into the room. And in fact, I remember very well, some parents would even run away when they heard that the palliative care doctor was coming. 
And I found this very upsetting because I had a real belief that what I had to offer was going to be something that was going to be very helpful. That I was coming not with a message of sadness and death, but peddling hope and a relief of suffering. But for some reason, this is how I was always greeted. I gave a lot of thought to this and I started to realize that for parents, palliative care is viewed something like this. That at any moment in their child's medical journey, they may find themselves at a crossroads. And at this crossroads, they have a decision to make. They can either go to the right side, the light side, the bright side in this picture, which is the side of hope. This is maybe going for a bone marrow transplant, a second bone marrow transplant, going back to the ICU for another round of intubation. But something, even if it's less, not very likely to work, something that makes hope so that the, children, the child could continue to live longer. Or they could go to the other side, the dark side, except that we had reached the end of the journey, focus on the child's comfort, and accept palliative care. This is again how most of the families at Sick Children's Hospital viewed my service. I quickly found out that it wasn't only the families who had this impression. Shortly after I became the medical director of palliative care at Sick Kids, this major study was published in Canada's top medical journal by my friends and colleagues at Sick Kids Hospital, the oncologists. Take a look at the title. Chemotherapy versus supportive care alone in pediatric palliative care for cancer. What the authors of this study did is they sent a survey to parents whose children had cancer, but they asked them not about their own child, but about a hypothetical child. It, they felt it would be a little bit too hard if it was about their child, but they said they wanted parents who could understand this, who were actually going through this, and they said, imagine you were the parent of a child with cancer that was incurable, that we were not able to cure. And imagine we gave you two options. The first option, is we could give your child more chemotherapy. This chemotherapy was certainly not going to cure your child's cancer. The hope is that maybe it would help a little bit, but we also know that there is a high likelihood that it would come with some negative side effects, potentially increased suffering, and you would need to still come to the hospital for various reasons. Or we could refer you to palliative care try to help you stay at home and focus on making sure that your child's life is as comfortable as possible and that your family is well supported. And this was the reason in the background of the study why the authors said we need to do this research. This is what they wrote in their study. When cure becomes unlikely, parents and healthcare providers are often faced with the decision to continue further aggressive treatments or provide relief of symptoms alone. Does this look familiar? Either or. That fork in the road, this is the way my oncologist colleagues see it as well. And here's what they found in the study, and I don't think the findings are all that surprising. They found that significantly more parents, about 55%, when compared with the oncology healthcare professionals, favored continued use of chemotherapy. Again, what that means is, when given the option, even though they knew the chemotherapy wouldn't ultimately help, even though they were told that it might even lead to more suffering in their child, they still preferred the chemotherapy over palliative care. And why was that? Well, the authors kept coming back to one word over and over again. Hope. Hope was the reason. For these parents, chemotherapy for their child, even in a situation where they knew in their heart it wasn't going to work, was something that offered hope. I think the best I can you know, make an analogy is I think it's the same reason why when our lottery in Ontario gets up to about $50 million, I always buy a ticket. I know I'm not going to win. But somebody has to win, right? And I know that if I don't play, 
it's not going to be me. And maybe, just maybe, this time around, I will be the lucky one. I think this is often how parents think of this situation as well. If they don't take the chemotherapy, then that's it. They're not playing in the game. They're not in the lottery. Even though they know it's very unlikely to help their child, maybe, just maybe, this time, this chemotherapy for their child will be the breakthrough that changes everything. And so it is hope that makes them go in this direction. Well, of course, when I started to figure this out, I went around to everybody in the hospital. I spoke with the oncologists and the neonatologists, the neurologists. I spoke with the complex care physicians, the ICU, anybody that would listen to me. And I said, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. Palliative care is not the absence of hope. We promote hope in a bad situation. Palliative care is not focused on dying. Our focus is on living. And if you don't believe me, take a look at what the World Health Organization says. Take a look at what the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association says. Take a look at what the Center for Advancing Palliative Care, the biggest palliative care organization in the US says. Here's their definition. Palliative care is specialized medical care for people with serious illnesses. It is focused on providing patients with relief from symptoms, pain, and stress of a serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. No mention of death, no mention of dying. And this is what I would go around talking, and I was met by everyone with the same thing. Nobody was listening to me. Nobody believed that this is really what palliative care was all about. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out why this was. Why was there this very large discrepancy with the way that we see ourselves in palliative care as a group that focuses on quality of life and hope, and why the rest of the society, the people living in Canada, the person on the street, my oncology clinicians, my neurology friends, why did they all see us as being just about death and dying? And that's when it hit me. That while Lucy explained pediatric palliative care is something different, we have relatively small numbers, and as a result, we can focus on quality of life, and it's not uncommon for us to get involved very early in the care of our patients. In fact, it helps break down some of the barriers. But we are always being compared to adult palliative care. Adult palliative care is 99% of all palliative care in my province of Ontario, and I'm sure the same is too, true in the Czech Republic. And when we look at what that looks like, we can look at studies like this. This study looked at the median time between the first referral to a palliative care service, an adult palliative care service, and the death of a patient for 127,000 people. And what they found was that the average amount of time that patients were seen by palliative care was just less than two months. Is it different in other places? Well, we often think of the UK as being one of the most advanced societies in palliative care. And in a very similar study, looking at the amount of time from when a patient is first referred to a palliative care team or physician to when they die, 48 days. And so you know what? The fact of the matter is, while we have these grand definitions that palliative care is really all about living, the real experience of the average Canadian is that palliative care is, in fact, all about death and dying. It is a focus on end of life. Now, I have to be clear that this is not a criticism. There is a very good reason why this is so. It comes back to that aging population I talked about before. I know that all of you share that same definition. I know that all of you agree that palliative care can and should be incorporated much earlier than the last month or three months of life. But the fact of the matter is we barely have enough resources in the adult world to look after the patients just before they die. With more resources, the hope is that we can do more. But as I mentioned, teams like the one at Motel Hospital, teams like Moholina's team and the other people that I've met, they have the ability to get involved and do things earlier 
and actually it can lead to better outcomes. And so it made me realize that somehow we had to disassociate ourselves in the pediatric world from the end of life care that was seen in the adult world. We needed to go from this image of palliative care to something more like this, where parents don't have to choose between hope and comfort, because if we make them choose between hope and palliative care, the majority are going to choose hope. And if I'm being honest with you, as a parent of three children, if you made me choose between hope and palliative care, I would choose, between, I would choose hope as well for my children. But if we could come up with a way to blend these things together, if we could tell parents that we can still fight the cancer, that as we are waiting for the heart transplant, we can still make sure that your child gets all the support they need, that your family gets the psychological support that they need, that we don't have to wait till your child is dying to make sure they're comfortable. We can make sure that they're comfortable all throughout their time with the diagnosis. And we can look for ways to improve quality of life, not only for your child, but the whole family. When we put it this way and put them together and not make parents choose, well, this is something that I, I have come to realize every family wants for their child. Nobody doesn't want their child to be more comfortable, more happy. And so with that, we changed our team name from the Palliative and Bereavement Care Service, a very good description of what we did, to the Pediatric Advanced Care Team, or PACT. And what difference did it make? Well, in just the first six years, we doubled the number of referrals that we had to our team. And we saw that the median days of care also doubled in nature. Because whereas the palliative and bereavement care service was seen as a team that got involved at the very end of life, the PAC team was a team that could get involved at any time. And physicians were more than happy to send us our patients to try to find ways to improve quality of life. Not only that, we started to get referrals from places that never referred to us before. Prior to becoming PAC, the average number of referrals from the cardiology team at our hospital was 0.5. How is that possible? Each year it was either zero or one. So the average was 0.5. Now cardiology gives us 30% of our referrals every year because PACT is something they can talk about with their teams. Palliative care, they didn't know how to talk about. We see patients going for bone marrow transplants all the time. And now we have families calling us, asking to meet the PAC team on a regular basis. I want to be super clear about something. We do not hide the fact that we are the palliative care team. Palliative care is the single best term to describe the type of care that I deliver and that the PAC team delivers. But we recognize that the term was also a barrier that it was limiting the number of patients and families that I could get to because of the fear of what palliative care meant. And so I needed to get my foot in the door, and once I could get in and meet these families, then I could explain that we are the Sick Kids Palliative Care team, and I could explain to them why, in fact, palliative care is right for your child and right for your family. So I just want to be super clear. It's not that I'm against the word palliative care, but the fact of the matter is, it was becoming a barrier. And once we remove that barrier, we could see many more patients and families. The last thing I wanted to emphasize is that we still do death. In fact, after becoming PACT, our involvement in end-of-life care for patients at sick kids went from 20% to more than 50% of patients. You might say, why just 50%? A reminder that most children do not die of chronic illness. Most children die of accidents or sudden things for which palliative care is not usually involved. But we are now involved in the majority of cases where children have lifelong, life-limiting chronic conditions. Our name wasn't the only thing that we felt needed to change. We also needed to figure out a way to meet the challenge of the service delivery 
And this, I think, as I've been here for a few days in the Czech Republic, I think is a very similar problem. In 2009, when I was still working at the Temi Latner Center, I made this map and I plotted the location in our province of Ontario where all the families followed by the Sick Kids Palliative Care team lived. What you can see here in red is the city of Toronto. The city of Toronto is actually about 50% bigger than the city of Prague. And we have almost three times the population of the city of Prague. So it's a very large area. And as I already mentioned to you, in this area, this is where we had the Temi Latner Center that we could partner with and we could get children home for end of life care. But notice how few of the pins are located in that red area. You see this cluster right here? This represents about an hour and a half drive in either direction from the hospital. Pins over here, this is about three hours away from Toronto, two hours away from Toronto. And there are many pins that didn't make it on this map because I zoomed in too closely. It is not uncommon, just like for Motel Children's Hospital, to have patients come from four, six, eight hours away to be at sick kids, to see their specialists, to meet with the palliative care team. The sicker they are, the further they are willing to travel to see the expertise that's in our hospital. And while we had the Temi Latner Center in Toronto, the only way to help these families get end-of-life care at home was for the members of the Sick Kids Palliative Care Service to deliver that care directly. Remember that before I joined the team, and even when I joined the team, it was a small team. There was one physician who only worked three days a week and one nurse. And the team was only available Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. And so if a patient out here wanted to be at home for end of life, it was up to that team to go out and make it happen. I remember when I did an elective with the team during my fellowship, one morning I joined the team and they said, be here at 8.30. And I came to the hospital at 8.30. We got in the car together and we drove on the highway for two hours to go see a patient that was dying in another community. In fact, the distance to this community was an hour and 20 minutes, but we got caught in traffic. When we arrived, the family was so happy that we made the travel to their home. They insisted on feeding us. We had tea and coffee. We spent an hour and a half talking about their child, preparing them for their child's end of life. We examined the child. We really gave what I think was very high quality palliative care. And then we got back in our car, we drove back to the city of Toronto, we got caught in traffic again, and we got home by 5.30 p.m. One whole day, one patient. That is all we saw. If this is the way that we were gonna operate forever, we were going to be very limited in the care that we could provide, in the number of children that we could get to go home for end of life care. Something needed to change. What was the answer? Well, some thought maybe we needed more pediatric palliative care experts. But in our society, this was never going to happen. This was a very expensive way to fix this problem. And in my opinion, in many ways, very inefficient to do. You know, if we had pediatric palliative care physicians living out here, they're only going to see one or two patients a year. They're not going to be very busy most of the time because the patients are going to come to Toronto. So there had to be a better way than us delivering the care directly. And so I started to wonder, maybe the shared care model that Larry Liebrach and I created at the Temi Latner Center that worked in the city of Toronto, maybe such a model could in fact work across the entire province of Ontario. Maybe what we would do is we would look for community clinicians who would provide the direct end-of-life care to our children, to our patients, and there would be a pediatric palliative care consultant like myself that would be available 24-7 to support them in their efforts. But the big question was, who were we going to find out there to provide this care? For me, the first natural answer was pediatricians. After all, it's pediatricians who train to look after children, 
I felt that they were the right people to go after. Well, I quickly learned that this was not going to work for many reasons. Number one, there are very few pediatricians as you get further and further away from the big cities. They're just not in every community. More and more patients in the small towns rely on GPs and family physicians to look after their, their chronic complex children. The other things is that pediatricians got very little exposure to death and dying in their training. Maybe one, two, three patients. And as they go out into their practice in their offices and they're doing vaccines and seeing well babies, the idea of getting involved in end of life care was something that they were not at all interested in. And so there had to be another partner. And that's when I realized that there is somebody in every single community in my province of Ontario, indeed in every community in Canada, and I would say even throughout the Czech Republic, even in my short time being here, there is somebody who is caring for dying adults. Somebody is doing this care. It looks different in different regions. Some have more, some have less, but somebody is doing it. And I wondered if this could be the group of people that we partner with. And so I undertook a survey of all the palliative care physicians affiliated with the Division of Palliative Care at the University of uh, Toronto. I think that this is very, a, a group that's very similar to those physicians in the Czech Society of Palliative Care. It represented actually a vast group of physicians from all over the province. Some worked in the city of Toronto, some worked in small villages, some worked in big groups like a mobile hospice. Some were lone wolves that did it by themselves and looked after all the individual patients in their community. Some did palliative care full time and had a specialty. Many of the palliative care clinicians uh, in Canada are GPs and family physicians who do this out of their passion, who maybe got a little bit of extra training but don't have, have a certificate. And I asked them, I surveyed them and I said, if we asked you to look after a child at the end of life, is this something you would be willing to do? The first question I asked them is, how much, if any, training did you get in pediatrics to work with children? Did you get any training? Did you feel at all comfortable to work with this population? And what we found is almost 80% of them said that they had insufficient training to be able to do this. The ones who did get a little bit of training, it was never a mandatory part of their training. It was always something that they sought for themselves. And as a result of this, the vast majority, about 80% said that they would be very uncomfortable looking after children at the end of life. But here was the most amazing part. The same group I asked them, despite your insufficient training, despite your lack of comfort, if I asked you, would you still be willing to do so, what would you say? And it was almost the reverse. The vast majority of these physicians said, I would be willing to do it. Even though I feel uncomfortable, even though you haven't trained me properly, I would be willing to look after these children. Why? Because if not me, who's going to do it? We asked them, what would you need to feel more comfortable doing this? Would you want more education? And everybody said, we would love more education, more teaching. But many of them also said, education was not going to be sufficient to make it work. The reason is that most of them realized that they would see maybe one or two children every year. And you might get education, but if you don't use it, you lose it. Each time they would see a new child, it would feel like the first time. Maybe one time they would see an infant, a baby with a genetic problem. The next time they would see an adolescent with osteosarcoma, and then a four-year-old with a metabolic disease. How do you start to feel comfortable if you see only one of these patients a year? So what they all really endorsed, what they all really wanted, was 24-7 support from an expert in pediatric palliative care. And so armed with this, I went to the, uh, to the Department of Pediatrics chair and I said that I believe if we create a team that's available 24-7, if you can let me build up this team from one physician who's available 
Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 to 5, to a whole service that's available 24-7, because we all know the problems occur Saturday morning at 2 in the morning, there had to be someone on the other side to answer the phone then, then I said, I think we can improve things. And, and I was uh, really lucky that my hospital got behind me and supported me to create this team. In the first two years of my practice, I spent a long time traveling all throughout Ontario, pushing this model of cooperation to anybody that would listen. And as my survey told me, everybody was very uncomfortable. Everybody was very nervous about it. But most of the people were very willing. They said, okay, if your team will back me up 24-7, then I will do it. And I'm very proud to say that now in 2019, there is almost nowhere in the province of Ontario that we cannot fi find a way to send a child home to receive high quality end of life care. So we had improved this opportunity, which was very important for some families. But the vast majority of families that we looked after at Sick Kids Hospital were still choosing to die in hospital. Most North American families do not want their child's death to be at home. The reason is that they have a great amount of trust in the children's hospital and a great amount of fear being in the community. They, they've been bypassing the community for so many years, they've become dependent and reliant on us at Sick Kids. And they liked that idea that there was going to be doctors and nurses around 24-7 in the hospital. And even though many of these families liked the idea of being in a warm, comfortable environment like home, they would prioritize being in the hospital where they knew they had access to the best care. So we were very fortunate in 2013 when we were able to open the doors of Emily's House Children's Hospice, Toronto's only pediatric hospice, a really remarkable, beautiful place. It has 10 beds where we are able to admit families who are now able to get the best of both worlds. They get 24-7 expert nursing and medical support. They're overseen by the PAC team, my service. But they are in a warm, house-like, home-like environment where the whole family can be together, where meals are made for the family, or they can choose to make their own meals in our kitchen if they want. And this creates a new opportunity for families that never existed before. Now you might wonder, Adam, can you really fill 10 beds with dying children? Are there so many dying children in the city of Toronto and in Ontario? The answer is no. Another big part of palliative care for children with chronic complex conditions is respite. When my wife and I need a break for our three children who are healthy, we go to the, to the teenager down the road and we get them to babysit our children. And I can get some relief. But the parents who look after these complex children, they have nobody to turn to. They need a nurse or a physician to look after their child. Now with Emily's House, they have a place that they can leave their child. And it's not just medical care that they're getting there. It is a social experience for these children. They love coming to Emily's House. There's music therapists, art. They get to be around with other children. It is fun. And they're overseen by nursing support that can give the expert care that they need so the parents can take a moment to charge their batteries, to look after their other siblings, the other kids in their family, and to do the things they want to do. This is a crucial component of pediatric palliative care. And it is also these families who come for respite that later on choose to have their child's end of life at Emily's house. So with Emily's house and the, the uh, partnerships that we made across the community, we were finally able to provide better end of life care for children in Ontario. It was better, but we still had some challenges. First of all, there were still many families who were reluctant to go to the community and have new adult providers take over at such a very important time. This was still a big worry for them. We found that the transitions from hospital to the community were sometimes awkward. We treat our patients and sick kids with what we might call kid gloves. We're very gentle with the way we talk about things, sometimes less direct. For example, families are not very open with their children at times, not talking openly about death and dying and cancer. 
And when some of my adult colleagues who go in, who are used to be very, very open and honest and direct with their patients, they speak in such a way that right away makes the family scared and worried about whether or not this is going to work. We were pretty good and we were always available to pick up the phone and help our adult colleagues deal with crises, but sometimes you were limited in what you could achieve over the phone. Sometimes when we would hang up the phone, I would turn to my colleagues on the team and I would say, we're going to be seeing this family in our emergency department later on tonight. I'm not sure they're going to be able to make this better. And finally, with Emily's house getting busier and busier and not on site at SickKids, it was becoming harder and harder for me and my, my uh, physician colleagues to figure out how to be in two places at once. We had lots of patients at SickKids, lots of patients at Emily's house. How do we take care of both? And so in 2015, we piloted a new role called the PACT Community Outreach Nurse Practitioner. This was the nurse practitioner that was on the team from the beginning, but she was moving into a new role. Basically, and I think you will see that this role looks very familiar to how I worked originally at the Temi Latner Center. We get her involved whenever a child and a family are transitioning from hospital to home for end of life care. She meets the families and then she joins the community adult team for the first home visit to create that seamless and smooth transition, to make sure everybody's on the same page and talking in the same language. She is also available to give crisis support. When we can't do it over the phone and we realize that we really need someone to go out in the home and help out, she is now available to go in the homes and help. She's willing to drive an hour, hour and a half away from the hospital, and if it's too far, she will join by FaceTime or something called telemedicine. And finally, because she is such a skilled nurse practitioner, when we admit patients to Emily's house for end of life care, she is the one providing most of the direct care under the supervision of a packed physician, and it is wonderful. The last thing I wanted to talk about is we still felt and we knew that the people that we work with in the community still wanted to build their capacity and their comfort. They still wanted education. And I will speak very briefly about this, but I really encourage you to look this up and Google this. We started a program at Sick Kids two years ago called Pediatric Project ECHO. ECHO stands for Extension in Community Healthcare Outcomes. And it was actually something that was begun at the University of New Mexico by a gastroenterologist. He recognized that patients were coming from all over New Mexico to see him to be treated with hepat for hepatitis C. And he had an eight-month waiting list. And he said, this is ridiculous. There are good GPs and family physicians who can do this, but they just don't know how. And so he started Echo Clinics online where GPs and nurses could come together and talk about patients and learn about patients, and he could build capacity out in the community. Project ECHO is something between telemedicine and a webinar. In telemedicine, another doctor sends me a patient to do a referral over video. I will see them, I will make some recommendations, and I will send them back to their physician in the community. It's a good thing, but by doing a telemedicine consult, I am helping one patient. And I'm really not helping that doctor that made the referral become any better. Because I did the work and I sent the patient back to them. This is telemedicine. A webinar is when somebody, an expert, gives a lecture to many people over the internet, an online conference, didactic teaching. But as we all know, Education in this form, while it's valued and something that we all do, rarely does it lead to a real change in practice. Rarely does it make people leave and feel like, I can do this now with my patients. But echo was something in between. This is what an echo clinic looks like. This is not taken from SickKids. This is, in fact, something I just took a picture online. This is from an echo clinic uh, that occurs in Africa looking after patients with HIV and AIDS all over Africa. But this is very similar to what our clinics look like every month. We use a technology called Zoom, and adult palliative care physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, volunteers 
care coordinators from all over Ontario tune in together to join our team at SickKids and we talk about patients. Usually, almost always, it is somebody in the community who is describing their patient in the community. The patient details is always de-identified. So there's always anonymous things presented. But we talk about the patient and the challenges that we are seeing. And they are challenges that everybody is experiencing all across the province. We talk about it together. We find solutions together. When I facilitate these clinics, most of the time I do none of the talking, but I let the people online help each other to figure out how to overcome the problems. And then at the end, I add a little bit of expertise. With this way, we are building capacity, and more importantly, we are building a community. Because the further you are from Toronto, the more these people feel like they're doing it all by themselves. And it's very hard to do this work alone. It's very isolating. But by coming together once a month, we are starting to build a community that we feel like we're doing this all together. And this is making a world of difference. And so to end, I wanted to share some lessons for those of you who work in adult palliative care because I've come to realize that some of the things I've learned in my journey in pediatrics are actually very applicable to your world as well. You know, one of the questions is that if palliative care starts seeing patients earlier and earlier, if we start moving away from just those who are very much near the end of their life, how are we going to do it? We're going to get too many referrals. And as I showed you, our referrals did increase dramatically when we became the PAC team. But interestingly, our workload did not. The reason for this is because when you start seeing patients with palliative care needs months or years before end of life, you can space the workout over many, many months. You don't have to do it all at once. And in fact, most of our visits are brief, five minutes in nature. We build a relationship over time. And in this way, when the child and the family then need end of life care, hospice pair, care, palliative care, there is no transition at all. They've been followed by the PAC team all along. They know us, and there's no difficult new introduction. And there has been no major increase in our workload. The other thing is that I would like to tell you the message that's opposite to one that you're always told. We always say in pediatrics, children are not just little adults. You can't just treat them like little adults. Well, my message to you is that in palliative care, children are just like little adults. You do have the skill set. You have the knowledge. You have the training to look after pediatric patients. It's not to say that there are not important differences, but with the help of people like Lucy, like Maholina, like Yitka, like some of the key individuals in the Czech Republic, together you can do this. Children are not so different as we made it out to be. The next thing I wanted to tell you is that these children are coming your way. As I showed you before, they are living longer. And so the children that we see in our children's hospitals with G-tubes and neurodevelopmental delay and seizure disorders and tracheostomies, they are coming to you. They're getting older. You are going to start to see them as your palliative care patients. And these are patients that you are going to feel very unfamiliar with. And I think that this is another opportunity for adults and pediatricians to collaborate because this is our bread and butter. And we can work together to show you how to deliver good palliative and end of life care to this group. And finally, it takes a village. We're talking about relatively small number of children who need end of life care. But if we are going to do it well, if we are going to allow these families to get the best quality, high quality end of life care in the setting of their choice, then we all have to work together in cooperation, providing what I call shared care where the pediatric palliative care experts and the adult mobile hospices and the adult palliative care physicians work together. This is the only way to do it successfully and in a cost-effective way and in an efficient manner. Thank you very much.
Thank you.